Good morning, church. Good to see you. Good to be back from Kurdistan. Thank you for your prayers. How many of you prayed? Can I see your hands? No guilt trip if you didn't, but you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank uh, you. Some of the things I'll share with you today, you need, we always need to remember who's ever sharing faith stories and things that happen, it was never just about them exercising their faith. It's always about the body of Christ. So, you know, whatever good goes on in the world that we go to, you need to understand you are a vital part, even if you're here. Your prayers avail much. So thank you. Well, we're going to go into John chapter 4. Uh, this could be a really dysfunctional message because I, I look at the clock, I look at the notes, I look at the stories, and, you know, we need a miracle. We need a miracle. We are in a series, yeah, I just listened to uh, two of them. I, I listened to John Harris's, I listened to Pastor Brandon. Good stuff. The foundational verse, Building the Well Within, is John chapter 7, verse 38, which I think you have. Yeah, there we go. I want us to all read this together, okay? And, and let's read it like, like emphatic, okay? Not, you know, buzz, 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 buzz. okay? You know, sometimes we get in that little church mode thing. Let's get out of that mode. John 7, verse 38, ready? Go. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Think about this. Here's just fun facts. The earth is 71% water. The whole planet. What does that mean? That means the planet is full of life. Water always gives life. When Jesus talks about water, whenever he talks about it, it always has to do with life. L water is life giving. Our bodies are made up of what? 60 to 65% of water. You need water. You can't go, you can maybe go three days, maybe four days, but right in there you will dehydrate and you will die without water. Water, what does water do in our bodies? You know, it detoxifies, it, it regenerates cells, it eliminates waste, it regulates body temperature. You know, um, of all the uh, vegetables and fruits, they're all 75 to 85% water. Once again, water is a life-giving property that God designed. We can't, we can't live without it. And when Jesus talks about water, except for the flood, when he talks about Noah and the flood, okay, it's always about life. It's always about giving life. Now, let me tell you this. I've been to the Dead Sea. Newsflash, it's dead. <laughs> the Dead Sea is dead, Okay. It is a huge sea. It is a huge body of water. Water everywhere, but it's dead. It's salty. And the reason it's dead is because it has no inflow and it has no outflow. Look at that as a picture of the Christian life. If you have inflow and no outflow, uh, you're backed up. <clears throat> okay? <laughs> You're backed up. If you have outgo without inflow from the Spirit, you have burnout. Now, just think about your life. A river is meant to flow. It's meant to travel. It's meant to pick up from one source and bring it to another source. And we're in that river, the river of God. And the next verse after that, when he talks about the, the rivers of living water, he spoke of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't a one-time event where we became Christian. We got born by God, by the Spirit of God. And then he has given us his Holy Spirit. And we are to be constantly infilled with the Holy Spirit. And so our life is inflow, worship, adoration, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus modeled it. Time alone with the Father. Fill up, give out. Fill up, give out. That is the normal Christian life. John chapter 4, verse 1. In fact, your homework is to read John chapter 4 because I'm not going to be able to hit all of it, all the nuances, the history, um, but, it, but it's, it's so pertinent to what we're talking about. Verse 1, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Everybody say that. He had to pass through Samaria. Say it again. He had to pass through Samaria. 
Some translation says, <laughs> archaic, you know, the King James says, he must needs to go through Samaria. <laughs> it just means there's, he ha- he's compelled. He has to go through Samaria. Now, what's interesting is to get from Judea uh, to Galilee, where they were going, is a straight line. It's about 70 miles, but they didn't go there because it was mountainous, and the easier route was around, even though it was longer. When Jesus says he has to go to Samaria, there's a people group, and there's a woman that he desperately wants to reach because he loves her. And that's what this story is really all about. In verse 7, it says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. What Jesus is doing is an act of scandal right here. Talking and addressing a woman, a Samaritan woman, is scandalous. But let me tell you, Jesus is not afraid of scandals Jesus creates scandals. And sometimes he creates scandals just to re- rough religious feathers. He, that's my Jesus. That's what he does. Now, I don't have time to go into the history of the Samaritans, but you just need to understand. There was hatred and there was prejudice. It was racial. It was about race. It was about mixed marriages. It was about idolatry. It was political. It was about 550 years of bad blood between Jews and Samaritans. They mixed the religions. The Samaritans picked and chose what parts of the Torah they would believe and obey and read and honor. And then they mixed in a few idols there. So these were, I mean, they were just a despised people group. And Jesus goes front and center. I absolutely love that. I want to give you three observations about Jesus' life here. And I want you to think about it in terms of your life. And here's the first observation. If we follow Jesus, we have to get used to going to out-of-the-way places to reach out-of-sorts people. If you're a Christian, if you say you're a Christian, if you say you follow Jesus, you and I have to get used to going to way out-of-the-way places and to reach out-of-sorts people. And I will just tell you, on some level or some degree, people that don't know Jesus are out-of-sorts. Sin makes people out-of-sorts. Fragmented, dysfunctional, sick, twisted, alienated, marginalized, etc., etc. The list goes on and on, and that's who Jesus came to reach. And Jesus walks right into the middle of it because that's what love does. Love isn't afraid of hostility, isn't afraid of prejudice, isn't afraid of people that most people don't want to spend time with. Love is not at all intimidated by that. Love goes on the offensive. It doesn't hide. It doesn't retreat. It doesn't go, ooh, that's a little uncomfortable to talk to those people. When the love of God is flowing in your life, people are people at the end of the day. I would tell you, it doesn't matter what the country looks like, what color the people are, the customs, the cultures, what they eat. People are the same all around the planet. They're broken and in need of Jesus, period. And religion and their bizarre religions haven't helped them. And so Jesus says, go. It's out of the way. It's inconvenient. You know, I think about it every time I travel. I can't buy a flight that's less than 30 hours of travel. It's like, okay, give me another route. Give me, there's no other route. 30 hours, no matter what. And it's exhausting. I will tell you, man, you cramped up in these, you know, seats and people. And I got to confess, I will confess one sin. (laughs) This was bad. I'll just tell you how kind of agitating it gets. Sometimes people in other cultures don't respect that whole American space thing. So you get some guy that just thinks his seat is his seat plus half of my seat. And he was a big dude. And I kind of nudged him a little bit. And then I waited to, to, to take over the, the deal. And we went back and forth. And I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm getting a little frustrated. Just a little, a little cranky there. And he finally does that thing again like that. And I just went, boom. I did. I'm sorry. I'm confessing. I'm con- don't tell my wife, okay? Just don't tell my wife. I did. I just, bam, elbowed him. He, he looked back. I said. <laughs> he was a big dude, man. I'm not even kidding. I thought, this would be bad press. 
American pastor gets thrown off the airplane for... But I'm just telling you, it's hard. And the time zones, 12, 13 time zones, man, you're just messed up. But I will tell you, it's worth it. Because... Because when you're going to do these things that God calls you to do, regardless of how comfortable or inconvenient or hard they are, there's a grace and a favor that comes with it that is absolutely life-giving. So me, Gunner, Emily, and little Moses, Mo. So we decide we, we need to go to Iraq. We're going to, we're going to go to Kurdistan. We're going to go to Iraq. And uh, there's only a little problem there. The problem was that some rockets had gone into our embassy and there was a couple, uh, one or two people that had died, and it was 14 rockets went in. And then a few days before we left, there was another one that went in. The guy didn't die from the, from the rocket. He was an American contractor. He didn't die from the rocket. He had a heart attack because of it and died. So there was a travel ban, okay? You're not supposed to go. I said, looked up everything. You're not supposed to go. We felt like we were supposed to go. And sometimes having a little dyslexia is great. Travel ban to me means come on over. So, <laughs> so... I said, you guys feel like, I mean, we're supposed to go. They said, yeah, we do. And, you know, I tried to weasel out of it a little bit in a diplomatic, spiritual way. You know, well, maybe the Lord said, but you know, so the Lord said, I didn't call you to get out of anything. It's like, okay, well, we're going. So we go. You guys feel good. You feel good. Moses, you feel good. You're 11 months old. You're the, you're the leader of this thing here. So you good? He's good. So we get, to, we get from Sacramento, we get to SeaTac. okay? We're boarding the plane to go to Doha, Middle East, Okay. We get there. We get up there. I get up there. I said, okay, can I have your passport? Yep. Bam. Can I have your COVID test? Bam. Negative. Yes. Um, I need your sponsor letter and your invitation. I said, I don't have a sponsor letter. Where's your invitation? I said, I have a verbal invitation. <laughs> she looks at me. She goes, I'm really sorry. I said, I'm sorry too, but I'll get a visa when I get there in the airport in Iraq. And she said, ah, it doesn't work that way. Meanwhile, people are lining up. They're lying. And there's me. <laughs> and I just said, no, it'll be fine. I'll go. And, and you know, they'll, I'll, they'll give me a visa because they've invited me there. I have a nonprofit and they've invited me there. And she goes, oh, she starts getting frustrated. She's asking somebody over here. She's asking me. I'm just standing there. And Gunnar, Emily, and Moses are praying, Jesus, 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 help us, help us, help us. So, so anyways, back and forth. I need to get an override then. I said, get the override, whatever that means. Don't know what an override is. She's got two phones going. She's calling two people. They're not answering. Well, I don't know what to tell you. People are lining up. I'm really sorry about the, the wait and the line. It's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> so, so we go. You know, and she goes and she goes, well, you know, I said, no, it'll be fine. They'll give us a visa when we get there. No problem. She goes, okay, just go. I said, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Come on, Mo. Come on, Gunner and Emily. We get on there. Now, here's the kicker, okay? We get on the plane. I'm sitting there, and my friend who's supposed to be on that plane, and he's a well-traveled missionary, he texts me and goes, I'm at the gate. I said, awesome. He said, they won't let me on. I said, really? Why won't they let you on? He goes, I don't know. I have a sponsor letter, and I have an invitation letter. I said, don't know what to tell you. Sounds like you overprepared for this one. No, I didn't say that. But, it, you know, they didn't let him on the plane. He didn't get to go. He had the right documents. He didn't get to go. I had the favor of God. Come on, we're going over there. We're going to, Okay. That's life-giving. I don't know about you. I'm pretty, pretty, like, wound up at this point. And then I'm sitting on the plane thinking, wonder what's going to happen when we get there. <laughs> oh, we got 16 hours. We'll just, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay. <laughs> there comes a point when you minister to people in other places where you know that God has divinely sent you to that specific person. Now, listen, does Jesus love everybody? Yes. Does Jesus love the Samaritans? Yes. yes. But Jesus, why is he zeroed in on this woman at a well at Samaria? And I will tell you that there, I, I can tell you every trip I've been on, there's always one person. And, and I don't care how many people you, you preach to, how many people you pray with. I will tell you, there's always one that God says, this is the one. Can't explain it. Don't understand. And I'm able to look them in the eye and tell them emphatically with all confidence that God sent me here for you. 
And it's a game changer in people's lives right there. You need to understand that. You're just not going. You're just not going to go. You're being sent. You are going for a specific encounter or encounters. It's an incredible thing. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God, the free gift, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus knows he has what you need. You and I need to know in Christ we have what the world needs. We know whatever the world has is pales in comparison to what Jesus has to give and who he is. And once again, if you just do a, a, a quick background check here, you'll just see some crazy stuff here. The Jews weren't supposed to speak to Samaritans. Now just listen to the prejudice here. Jews weren't supposed to speak to Samaritans. Men's, men weren't permitted to address women without their wives present. Rabbis wouldn't speak to their own wives in public. There's a Jewish saying, may I never set eyes on a Samaritan. That, that was a saying. Jewish men would pray daily. Blessed are you, O God. Sounds good so far, doesn't it? <laughs> blessed, blessed are you, O God. I like that. That sounds good. King of the universe. How many of you think that sounds good? That's a great prayer. Who has not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Half the prayer is good, half the prayer is garbage. That's what they thought of women. That's what they thought of Gentiles. Unbelievable here. Jesus is doubling down. He's saying, I'm not here to talk about customs. I'm not here to talk about culture. I'm here to talk about life. And we'll see in the story that the lady does these little shifts and, 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 and maneuvers to, to try to get out of the true issue at hand. But I, I want to show you a person here, and this is the person that I believe that I was sent to when I went. So pick up that first picture, okay? This, we have her uh, face blotted out because of security reasons. I can't tell you her name, but this is in a uh, IDP uh, refugee camp in uh, Kurdistan, Iraq. We... When I went there, December of 2019, found her. It was a divine appointment then. Uh, incredible hardship, incredible backstory that I'll share in a few minutes. Um, but I knew then I was sent there for her. She was one. I come back. Her mom, uh, dying of cancer, was able to help her with medication for her mother. Mother's been taken out of the camp and in a hospital, and she's there all alone. In the meantime, in the last year and four months, we have uh, what's apt, a few text messages. I've prayed for her, her, and now here we are again, okay? She had been there, I don't know how long already, a year or two. Now it's been another year and four months in a tent, and she's got nowhere to go, She's got no family to go to, and she's a Syrian refugee, okay? So this thing is nothing but complicated. Now think about this. In the Middle East, you've got majority Muslims. Uh, Iraq is right next to Turkey, Syria, and Iran. 86% of all Muslims will say they don't even know one Christian when surveyed. So part of why you go to places like this is so that that number goes down and that they do know Christians. Um, show me the next picture. I think it's, uh, yeah, here's Gunner and the boys. <laughs> These are some guy, family members of a friend there, uh, and they went on a hike, and he prayed for several of them and shared the gospel with several of them that would have never got to hear the gospel. Okay, so that's, they're still there, by the way. They're still there, so we need to pray for them. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with the wells deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well, drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. You know, you got to understand, old religion is all about sacred sites that are venerated. 
They're, they're, they're about customs, they're about rituals, they're about artifacts, they're, they're about you know, stones, they're about different things like that. And Jesus transcends all of that kind of stuff. Not that they're not bad reference points. You need to understand that Jesus is greater than all of the artifacts, all of the culture, all of the rituals that don't bring life. They point to him. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's, that's what's in us. I mean, remember John 3, when Jesus addresses Nicodemus, what does he say to him? He says, you must be born again. If a man is not born of the water and the spirit, he can't have the kingdom of God. Water and spirit. So this, once again, you get back to this thing. Water is a big deal. You and I have the Holy Spirit. We have the spring, the living spring of the living God inside us. She's thirsty. Urban Dictionary defines thirsty as too eager to get something desperate. Desperation could be in reference to anything. Compliments, validation, attention, Specifically, I mean desperate for sex. Addictions can't quench. Pornography can't quench. A million relationships can't quench. Multiple partners can't quench. Substance can't quench. Food can't quench. Junk food can't quench. Social media can't quench. It always leave you hanging, always leave you thirsty. I don't care if you get a billion likes. A billion, you're amazing. It will never be enough because the flesh is never satisfied. The flesh always points in one direction. More, 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 more. Rivers of living water point to life now, contentment now, peace now. That's what Jesus is addressing right here. She had five husbands. That's a lot of husbands. Call me old school. That just seems like a lot to me. She's hungry for something, and it's more than a marriage certificate. She's thirsty. She's desperate. John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to him, to, said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You won't have the compulsive restlessness, the compulsive longings, the compulsive cravings, the compulsive, compulsive shame cycle that goes with thirsty addictions. It's called satisfaction in Jesus. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, now I love this. Just going to tell you, I love this. Go call your husband and come here. <laughs> the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. You've had five husbands. Not one, not uno, dos, tres, cuatro, or cinco. Five of you have five husbands. Five husbands. And the one now you have is not your husband. Shacking up with him. What have you said is true? Woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> I'm usually not very discerning because I'm preoccupied with my past. However, on this enlightened moment, <laughs> I got a hunch you're a prophet. <laughs> okay? Don't miss this. You read that at face value and you think, man, Jesus is a prophet and he's calling her out because that's what prophets did. They called him out. They judged him harshly. If somebody said a prophet was coming to town. People weren't like, oh boy, get me on the list. Did I make the list? Am I going to see the prophet? No, no. It was like, oh man, I got stuff to do. <laughs> I'm a little busy. And the dirtier you were, the busier you were to get out of going to seeing a prophet. You don't want to see prophets. Now I'm going to tell you, here's the nugget right here. Are you ready? Jesus is calling her out of her pain. He's not calling her out just to call her out. 
He's calling her out. He's calling her pain out of her. Where you see sin, you see pain. Where you see pain, you see sin. They're linked. I think sometimes we go after sin when we should be going after pain. And that's why people don't want to talk to a lot of Christians. I think we go after the wrong thing. You start talking about pain, that's a different conversation. Jesus knows it's sin. He's not saying you're trying to dupe me here. No, no, no. He's calling pain. He's not excusing her or accusing her. He's loving her. Observation number two. If you follow Jesus, you are going to have to get used to people's pain. You're just going to have to. If you say, if I say, I have Jesus living on the inside of me, that means there are times where I should be moved with compassion. Jesus, it says, was often moved with compassion and he healed them. If I'm, if I'm a Christian, there should be times where I'm deeply disturbed by somebody else's pain. Now, a way to get around that is you don't engage. You look at people as statistics. You look at people as some kind of chart. But you don't engage because if you don't engage, you don't have to let your heart get opened up. And the great thing about when you're dealing with somebody in pain is a lot of times you don't have the answer. Now, the, the interesting thing is, I'm going to tell you how desperate a place this is. I want you to show this tent. There's 9,000 people in this place, and that's just a row of tents. And when you, when you pull into this place, there are two giant boards that tell you all the sponsors, the countries, USAID, Samaritan's Purse, World Vision, this country, that country, all these people that are helping and thank God for it, and they do meet the ba basic necessities, and that's it. But they can't bring transformation. They can bring food, they can bring water, they can bring tea, and they can bring a kerosene heater, but they cannot bring transformation. And that tent right there is, that's this gal's tent right there. It's a carpet floor, it's two mats, and there's a kerosene heater, and that's about it. And it's in that. So now this is the second time we're there. And so I got Gunner. I got my friend Rick who finally did make it over there. And we are just sharing the gospel with her. And we are just loving her. And then you think, okay, wow, this is great. And this is fun. And then you hear the story. The story. Comes from Syria. Refugee. Dad molested her. Another religious denominations, humanitarian aid worker molested her. How bad was it? Well, when the bomb started dropping in her little village and town, she was actually glad because that gave her a way to escape. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Bombs are dropping, things are getting blown up, and you're thinking, I can escape. This is a way to get out of here. And she bolts. She leaves Syria. She ends up in Kurdistan, and now she's in a tent, and she's in a tent for years. And as you're listening to the story, oh, yeah, forgot to tell you, her sister committed suicide by shooting herself in the head. That's right. I forgot that one. And I want you to think about the pain. And you're just thinking, and she's wanted to kill herself. And you're, it's at that moment, you're sitting there, and you're on your knees, and you're looking at her, and, and it really hits you. The only thing you have to offer her is Jesus. There isn't a self-help book on the planet that's going to help her. There's, there's nothing that's going to help her. And I'm telling you, there's, that's an <clears throat> absolute vulnerable place to be to where you realize money isn't the answer. She can't get out of there. There's nowhere to go. She has nowhere to go. She cannot get out of there. And here's what I say to her. I said, you don't know what to do with your pain that's just really true because the only one that is qualified to deal with pain is the one who suffered the most. And that's Jesus. The only one that's qualified to deal with anybody's pain is the one who took our pain on him. And that is absolutely life giving freeing. I don't need anything else. I need a few scriptures. I need a few stories. I need my testimony. I need other people's testimonies. And I just pumped into her, pumped into her and pumped into her and pumped into her. She's not going anywhere. She's got to listen to me. And we prayed. And we talked. 
It was amazing. I'm telling you, she will come to Christ. But she is so desperate that if you, if you showed up in a bunny suit and said, I'm God and I can get you out of here, you have my allegiance, she would go. So desperate. We're, we're talking desperate. But you know what? God, it hit me that God is abs- absolutely desperate to reach her. I mean, there's humanitarian aid workers that go there, sure. She doesn't, doesn't do anything. How desperate is God to get you and me to people that don't know him, that need his touch, need his healing? I'm going to tell you the second half of the plane story. Ready? In the air, I'm thinking, Jesus, you got to do something, man, because we're going to a place we ain't supposed to go. And uh, we don't know how this is going to happen. We travel all night, four planes. We get in there, in line. There's the visa immigration, two military guys, whatever they are, police. They're there, people in front of me, and I hear them. Invitation letter, sponsor letter, passport, COVID test. <clears throat> got two out of four. So, so they... I see people in front of us. They're handing them their stuff, okay? They, they go. Man. Passport. COVID test. Yep. Sponsor. Uh, I don't have that right now. Uh, invitation letter. I have a verbal in- invitation. No. No. Starts talking to the other guy. I know. I said, I'm supposed to be here. I have a nonprofit. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I have my little certificate. I pull out my little certificate. I go, Three Build Global. This is my nonprofit. I'm supposed to be here. He goes, No, you're not supposed to be here. You're, in fact, you're going to have to probably get back on the plane and go back where you came from. I said, No, I'm supposed to be here. He, and they go back and forth. They're on the phone. I'm saying, Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So <laughs> he comes back. Uh, he goes, No. He goes, here's the list of government-authorized nonprofits. Your name is not on there. I said, I want you to put my name on that form, that paper, right now. (laughs) No. I said, yes. Put my name on the paper. He said, no. I said, he had three stars. I said, you have three stars. You have the authority. Put my name. Three build global on that paper because I want to come into this country. No. No. He says, no. I said, I want to talk to the four-star guy. Go get the four-star guy. Go get the four-star. And Emily and Gunnar are praying over there, you know. I said, I want the four-star guy. There is no four-star guy. I said, well, get one. Get my name on that thing. I'm here to register. That's why I'm here. I want to come. I want to serve your people. They go back on the phone. It's four in the morning, by the way. Four in the morning. And I'm just lit up, man. I'm like. This, we're, it's game time. The guy hands me the phone. <laughs> I say, hello. They said, Mr. Hasty, this is Qatar Airlines. How did you get on that plane? <laughs> said, J- you let me on. Just got on the plane. You are not supposed to be on that plane. Not my problem. I'm here. <laughs> if I'd been a little more on my toes, I just said, sounds like you got a little answering to do. But they went back and forth. I said, I have a friend. I have a friend. Always got a friend. I have a friend. Let me call him. So I called this guy, one guy I know in Kurdistan, okay, that I met a year and four months ago, texted him a couple of times. He's not answering. Why? Because it's four o'clock in the morning. So the guy escorts us to detention. <laughs> we go to detention, which is like, oh my gosh, I spent second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Detention. What is a big deal, man? Welcome home. I mean, my gosh. Give me a Coke, Twinkie, we'll call it good. So we go to the detention. We're all in this little detention thing. And so I'm desperately trying to call this guy. And so I, I, get, I get a hold of him, four o'clock in the morning. Hello. Sadula, how you doing, man? Bob, what are you doing? I said, they won't let me in the country. That's why I told you to send your, your airplane tickets. I said, well, I didn't know it was because of that. I said, we got a problem here. Oh, help, you got to help me. <laughs> Okay, let me call you back. We're sitting in detention. He calls me back. He says, okay, I have permission. I'm going to the office and I'm going to print you your invitation and your sponsor letter. I said, okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Five o'clock in the morning, 
Facebook Messenger. I get the documents. I go looking for three star. <laughs> I got it. We're walking back to the little visa booth and he says, I am a Christian. I said, really? I said, awesome. Gunner says, are you the Jesus kind of Christian? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, awesome. So we, we got an in, man. We got, and so we got the documents, bam, bam, and in we got. Now, once again, I know travel rules. You're not supposed to be doing that. They're not supposed to be letting you in places. But I'm telling you, if God wants you to get somewhere, he's going to get you there. And hell can't stop it. That's the mindset you got to have. And you know what? If God wants to reach your neighbor, hell can't stop it. You need to believe for the favor and grace of God on your life. Man, let's stand up. We're going to pray. This, I don't, you know, I don't really have time to go through the rest of this story. Bottom line is she is so touched. She goes back to her town and villages and says this. And this is why we know that Jesus' words to her about her 500s, 500s, her five husbands were full of grace and mercy. She couldn't get wait to get back to her town to tell everybody. Come, see a man who told me everything. You know, it was full of grace. And so they came and they believed. And then it says, we don't believe just because of your testimony, although that was the can opener. We believe because we've seen and heard him for ourselves. It's amazing. We do some ministry time right now, and I want to pray, and I want you to think about a couple of areas of your life. First area I want to think of, think about, is fear. Just fear. Second thing I want, to, I want you to think about is shame. Shame. That adversary rub your nose in your sin never lets you go. Third thing I want you to think about is your thirst, your misdirected thirst. The inordinate things can even be religion. Junk food, sex, whatever. Jesus wants to quench that thirst.